Okay, I don't have a gavel here, so we're going into the Judiciary Committee hearing this morning. My name is Carl Rhodes. I'm chair of the committee. Uh, this Zoom meeting and YouTube live stream event will include the following agenda, 930 for JDC. Uh, since it's our first hearing of the, uh, the year, why don't we go ahead and have everyone introduce themselves so those who are here. Uh, we'll start with Senator Rakeo Kaloli, the vice chair, although I do not see him. Uh, we'll go next to uh, Senator Ocasio. Aloha, good morning. Um, I am Laura Ocasio representing Hilo in the first district. Mahalo. Great, thanks. Next is uh, Senator Gabbard. Hello and good morning. Um, Senator Mike Gabbard represent uh, Senate District 20 in West Oahu. Thank you. Next is uh, Senator Lee. Doesn't appear to be here yet. Senator Kim, I see, but I can't hear. There you go. Happy New Year, Donna Mercado Kim, representing District Fort Senator District 14. Thank you. And finally, uh, Senator Favela, if he's here yet, I don't see him. But he's the final member of the committee. Okay, as noted, this hearing will be streamed live on YouTube. You can find links to viewing options for all Senate hearings and meetings on the live and on-demand video page of the legislature's website. If you're interested in seeing a written testimony, you can go to the, to the legislature's website at capital with an O, capital.hawaii.gov. In the unlikely event that we have to abruptly end this hearing due to major technical difficulties, the committee will reconvene to discuss any outstanding business on Thursday, January 27 at 9.25 a.m. And the public notice will be posted on the legislature's website. For the people testifying remotely, all testifier audio will be muted and video disabled until it's your turn to go. Um, per the committee's practice, there's a two minute time limit uh, on uh, oral testimony. If there are temporary glitches during your turn to testify, we may have to move on to the next person due to time constraints, but we'll try to come back to you if we can fix the problem quickly. Uh, we appreciate your understanding and remind you that the committee has already reviewed your written testimony. I'll be reading a list of names who submitted written testimony for each measure. We apologize that the closed captioning doesn't accurately transcribe the names. Again, if you're interested in seeing the written testimony, you can go to the legislature's website at capital.y.gov, capital with an O. And I think that's it. So let's go ahead and start. Our first bill today is SB 212. This increases the amount of fines that may be assessed against the non-candidate committee for violations of organizational report requirements and the amount of fines that may be assessed for violations of advertisement disclaimer requirements. First up on uh, 1212 is Gary Cam, General Counsel for Campaign Spending Commission. Who I see? Good morning. Uh, good morning, Chair. Members of the committee, uh, my name is Gary Cam. I'm with the Campaign Spending Commission. Uh, the commission supports the intent of this bill and uh, will stand on its written comments. Thank you. Thank you. Next is um, Sandy Ma, Executive Director for Common Cause Hawaii. Good morning. Good morning, Chair. Members of the committee, Sandy Ma with Common Cause Hawaii. Common Cause supports increasing fines for non-candidate committees for failure to file organizational reports or updating organizational reports. We find that uh, Increasing fines can increase transparency and accountability. We also support increasing fines uh, for failure to file uh, required disclosures for as advertisements as required by law. Um, we find that increasing fines for violations for failure to file advertisements as required by law is necessary to increase transparency in our electoral system and to limit misinformation and dis information for a fair election. The public must be properly informed of who is spending in our elections uh, to influence and sway our elections. Thank you for allowing Common Cause to testify in support of this measure, and I'm available to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, further testifiers who have not asked to be Zoomed in are Beppe Shapiro for the League of Women Voters in support. Uh, Talalik Tukuda in support, Barbara Best in support, Kathy Jaycox in support, and David Anderson in support. That's all the testifiers we have in SB 212. Members, questions for those who are here? If not, I have a question for uh, Mr. Can. If you're still here. Great. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. So on the, the provision that covers the disclaimer language, um, 
And I'm a little reluctant to increase the penalties for what I would view as, you know, if a candidate committee forgets to put their paid for by friends of uh, a poster or something like that, that seems like a very different matter than a super PAC that's spending a million dollars in a race um, to leave their disclaimer off. Is there any problem with us limiting uh, the, the increased fines to non-candidate committees for the disclaimer part? And just, I mean, not that we get rid of the fines for the candidate committees, but just leave them the same and increase them for the, for the non-candidate committees? I don't see any problems with doing that if that's the, uh, a bigger problem. Um, as you know, we're, we've, we're, we've tried to increase the fines for super PACs. <laughs> so, you know, we're not equating that with the fines for candidates. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Members, any other questions? Okay. If not, let's go ahead and move. Thank you, Mr. Cam. Let's go ahead and move on to the next bill, which is uh, SB665. This establishes that knowingly or intentionally providing false information concerning the name or address of a person paying for a campaign advertisement is a class C felony, repeals certain exemptions from criminal prosecutions for campaign finance violations. Okay, first up on SB 665 is Candace Park, uh, Deputy Attorney General. Uh, good there morning. you are, go ahead. Good morning. And uh, members of the committee, uh, we just wanna point out a small discrepancy in the language in section A, the term false information is, is used. In section C, the term false information is used. But in section B, prohibited information is used. And we feel it just would be prudent to be consistent with the language. So as to be clear as to what is the violation in section B. Thank you very much. Uh, next up is Gary Cam uh, for Campaign Spending Commission. Morning again. Can't hear you. There yeah. you go. Good, good morning, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. Uh, the commission stands on its uh, testimony in support of this bill. Okay, thank you. Next to Sandy Ma, Executive Director of Common Cause Hawaii. Good morning, Chair, members of the committee. Sandy Ma for Common Cause Hawaii. Uh, we support in part and oppose in part SB 665. Common Cause Hawaii supports um, SB 665, uh, the provision that subjects those to criminal penalties who intentionally provide false information um, about uh, the advertisements and people who are paying for the advertisements. We do have questions about that portion of section two, SB 665, which would allow the Campaign Spending Commission to refer a complaint to the Attorney General or the county prosecutor, um, which would, uh, we believe that adequate notice to the public should be given and there should be some kind of minimum threshold of misconduct before a criminal referral may be made. Um, so that's just our concern, giving uh, the public some adequate notice of uh, some threshold misconduct. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have one remaining testifier who does not did not want to zoom in. Uh, Beppe Shapiro, Legislative Committee for League of Women Voters, is in support. Okay, members, any questions for these witnesses? I mean, these testifiers. Uh, Senator Casio, go ahead. I just have a quick question for uh, Mr. Cam. Oh, okay. Hi. Thank you. I'm just wondering the frequency. And so the amount of times that this happens, um, that this violation occurs. Uh, the currently, the false uh, disclaimer. Yes. Uh, in the last election, we had one case of a false disclaimer and two cases of uh, we think intentionally not having the disclaimer. Uh, And I, I cannot recall specifically uh, for the other elections, but it's not a, I, I don't think it's that common. That's all, thank you. Thank you, members, any other questions? Okay, seeing none, let me just double check. No, I don't have any questions on this one either. Uh, let's, or in addition. 
Let's go ahead and move, thank you very much, Mr. Kim. Let's go ahead and move on to um, SB 741. This is this is the faithless elector bill requires an elector to vote for the candidate whose names appeared on the presidential general election ballot. Um, I did not hear this bill in past years because the uh, I didn't think it would hold up, but the, the U.S. Supreme Court has ruled fairly recently that you can force your electors to vote for who they say they will. So uh, that's why I put it on the agenda this year. Uh, first up on SB 741 is um, Janet Mason, uh, Win uh, League of Women Voters of Hawaii. I saw her here. Ms. Mason, you still here? Yes, I there am here. Go ahead. <laughs> and I have my video on. <laughs> And I am unmuted. Um, I'll just start. And uh, at some point, the video connection will catch up. Uh, the League supports this bill, even though we think the Electoral College should be eliminated. We're stuck with the Electoral College in the meantime. And so this bill is important because it prevents uh, an elector from subverting the will of the people who voted for the presidential candidate um, and subverts the intent of the party which the person represents. Um, we, we're very grateful to the introducers of the bill and for building the safeguard into the future. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you very much. Next is Sandy Ma, Executive Director of Common Cause Hawaii. Hello again. Good morning. Good morning again, Chair and members of the committee. Common Cause Hawaii supports um, SB 741 to ensure that the political will of the people as expressed by the ballot box is, as expressed at the ballot box is not overturned by a faithless elector. The Uniform Law Commission has approved um, a uniform faith Faithful Presidential Electors Act and recommends that states adopt such a measure. Um, and as Chair has already said, the U.S. Supreme Court has approved um, um, a you know, has approved a Faithless Electors Act uh, measure um, recently. So thank you um, for allowing Common Cause to testify in support of SB 741. And I'm available to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that's all the Zoom testimony we have. Uh also was in support. Members, any questions on 741? Yeah, question. Senator Favela, go ahead. Well, um, for, I guess, what the previous speaker said about presidential electors, uh, how much electors we have in Hawaii? Sorry, who's the question for? We, ha we have four, but if you... It could be any of them, it doesn't matter. I just wanted so, to know how, how much electors... Um, Sandy... And Ms. Ma, you want to answer that one? Four. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Members, any other questions? Uh, I don't see any. Let me just check and be sure. I don't have any. Yes. Okay, too. Okay, let's uh, go ahead and move on to SB 416. 416 clarifies applicable reimbursements to the state or defendant for expert witness fees. Uh, first on 416 is Trisha Nakamatsu, Deputy Prosecuting Attorney for the City and County. Good morning, Chair, Vice Good Chair, morning. members of the committee. Uh, Deputy Prosecutor Trisha Nakamatsu appearing on behalf of the Honolulu Prosecuting Attorney's Office. We thank you so much, Chair, for hearing the bill. This is part of our 2021 and 2022 legislative package. And I understand you have our testimony before you, so I'll keep it brief. This bill would basically ensure that existing practices continue so that not only all the county prosecutors, but also the public defenders and conflict counsel could retain uh, expert witnesses as needed in their criminal cases and then be re reimbursed for those um, reasonable expenses. Um, the our testimony goes into the history of this a bit, the timeline and why it's needed, um, where the problem, uh, as we see it, kind of originated. Um, but we're available for questions again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let's see. Uh, 
Uh, next, we have Rebecca Lique, acting prosecuting attorney for Kauai and support. Gerald Enriquez for the Maui County Department of the Prosecuting Attorney, also in support. And James Tabe, the public defender, also in support. Members, that's it for testifiers. Any questions for Ms. Nakamatsu? Okay, seeing none, let me just double check here. There. Let's go ahead and move on to the next bill, which is SB 832. This expands the Victor count, victim counselor privilege under rules of evidence 505.5 of the Hawaii to include confidential advocates employed by the University of Hawaii. First up on um, 823 is Jan Govea or Jennifer Rose uh, for the University of Hawaii. Thank Ms. you, Chair, Vice Chair. Good morning. Uh, good morning, members of the committee. Um, the University of Hawaii stands on our written testimony in support of this measure. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Uh, we have a number of other testifiers who did not want to Zoom. Carolyn Dassault in support, Jojo Miller in support, Leah Messing in support, Leslie Kaming, Kamingabong in support, Carl Jabola Corollis for the State Commission on the Status of Women in support, Lynn, Lynn Castales Matsuoka, Associate Director for the Sex Abuse Treatment Center of Hawaii in support, Shannon Tran in support, Miley Griffin in support, Jamie Wallow in support. Angela Mercado, Executive Director for Hawaii State Coalition against Domestic Violence in support, and Stuart Silva also in support. That's all the testimony we have. Members, any questions on SB 832? Ms. Govea, maybe you could explain, um, so I think the, the privilege here has been described as semi-absolute. Can you tell us how that works in practice? What's the, the prep? Well, we, we, the University of Hawaii has positions um, on our campuses called confidential advocates. Mm -hmm. And they are intended to be um, counselors or advocates for, for victims of various forms of um, sexual misconduct. Uh, and so we just are making sure that the Hawaii rules of evidence um, clearly cover um, any communication between a victim and a confidential advocate at the University of Hawaii um, to be a privileged and confidential communication. This will encourage uh, our, our victims to speak freely um, so that they can receive um, the proper support and access to programs um, that are available. Okay, thank you very much. Members, any other questions? If not, let's go ahead and move on. Thank you, Ms. Govea. Um, let's thank move you. on to SB 777. Uh, this establishes a criminal statute for the criminal destruction of a tree on state or county property punishable as a misdemeanor. Uh, first up on 777 is Corey Young, Deputy Attorney General. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, Good morning. Committee. Um, basically, our two concerns were one was just technical. We would ask that the state of mind be moved out of 1A and into Section 1. That would allow the state of mind to cover both 1A and 1B. Um, our second concern was the bill as currently written would require an arborist to be called in every case um, and consulted even for sentencing. Um, this might end up being costly for the prosecuting attorney offices that are trying to um, basically handle these matters. If a matter pleads out prior to any trial or any um, basically other disposition, um, what you could see is the need simply to sentence to have to retain an expert witness, an arborist to basically ascertain the value of the tree, even if the parties otherwise would have been able to consult with each other, confer and come to some kind of agreement. Um, our recommended language would just allow in those instances where the parties can agree on the value of the tree to allow them to go forward without having to basically retain an expert witness to establish that value. The only other um, issue we had was to make sure that, the, that we actually gave full effect um, to the bill and to the bill's intent. There is one um, term potential value that's very innovative um, in its use in a criminal statute but potential value could have a number of meanings as it pertains to a tree. 
Um, we understand that you know these trees are going to be chopped down. People are going to haul them away. So it's going to be very difficult for a prosecutor's office to establish the actual value of a tree in a lot of cases. So the idea of potential value has a lot of merit, but it may need to be a little further fleshed out because we also did see the potential for, you know, if you're talking about a flowering or a fruiting tree, are you talking about the potential value for 20 years of the fruit? Or are you talking about the value of the tree that was cut down today or yesterday or whenever it was cut, if it were to be taken to, um, you know, some kind of place to be sold? So that was the only issue as far as that. Um, I stand ready to answer any questions. Thank you for allowing me this opportunity to speak. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, uh, that's all for the Zoom testifiers. Next is Ed Sniffen with the uh, De Deputy Director for Highways at Department of Transportation. In support with a suggested amendment, Daniel Donnell testifying for trees for Honolulu's future and support. Trisha Nakamatsu, uh, Deputy Prosecuting Attorney for Sydney County with comments. And Ray Codero, a council member for the City and County of Honolulu, also in support. That's all the testimony we have on 777. Members, any questions for uh, Mr. Young? Okay, seeing none, um, I don't have any either. Let's go ahead and move on to the next bill, which is SB 573 relating to wildlife, requires all habitat conservation plans to include an agreement for plan participates, participants to enter into and maintain an annual service contract with a standby and response facility available to provide emergency medical and rehabilitation services to nat native wildlife affected by activities undertaken within the plan area. First up on 573 is uh, Suzanne Case or David Smith for DLNR. Yeah, good morning, David Smith, Administrator with the Division of Forestry and Wildlife. Uh, we'll stand on our uh, written testimony and support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that's all the Zoom testimony we have. Uh, we have Herbert Tim Richards, council member for the uh, Hawaii Island County Council in support. Linda Elliott, president and center director for Hawaii Wildlife Center in support. Bob Osterland for Kauai Albatross Network in support. Max Phillips, director for the Center for Biological Diversity in support. Molly Bosch, uh, for Save Our Shearwaters and support. Frederick Riddell, Executive Director for Hawaii Clean Power Alliance in opposition. Uh, Vicki Carmitani in support. Renee Irene Breeden in support. Carol Davies in support. Karen Lobel Freed in support. Jennifer Barrett in support. James Waddington in support. Cindy Granholm in support. Nancy Rustad in support. And Angela Hunt, Huntemeyer, Huntemer in support. Ruth Yinder in support, Melissa Price in support, Dr. Kimberly Greeson in support, Moana Bajour for the Conservation Council for Hawaii in support, uh, Douglas Perrin in support, Jan Wisnovich in support, Meredith Miller in support, Ray Okawa in support, Linda Wallach in support, Hannah Moon in support, and Nathan Ewan in support. And that's all the testimony we have on 573. Members, any questions for one person who zoomed in. No, okay, let's see. Let's check here. Okay, I don't have any questions either. If, um, if no one else has any, we'll go ahead. Thank you very much for being here, Mr. Smith. Uh, we'll move on to SB 988. Would establish guidelines for unpaid internships under the stage wage and hour law. Uh, the only testifier on this is uh, Director Anna Pereira Stacio, Stacio for DLIR, the Department of Labor and Industrial Relations. Uh, good morning, Chair Rhodes, Vice morning. Chair Kea Hochlole, and members of the committee, Bill Kunzman, on behalf of Director Pereira and Stacio. We'll stand on our testimony in support as this measure essentially codifies custom and practice with the guidelines found in federal law and we're available for questions if there are any. Thank you. Thank you. Members, that's the only testifier we have on this measure. Does anyone, does anyone have any questions on this? Uh, Mr. Crinsman, I do. Um, what, what is the, what's current practice on uh, retirees if they wanna go volunteer at a 
senior center or 5013C or something like that. Is that, is that um, currently, I mean, it is allowable, right? You know, I have uh, Mari Amamura and Cheryl Lee from the Wage Standards Division here who probably be uh, more appropriate to answer your question, Chuck. Okay, great, sure. So while interns are waiting, um, I have a is allowed as long as they understand that that's exactly what they're doing. It's volunteering and no um, wages is promised. Okay, so under this under the current the draft of this uh, S, uh, SB nine eighty eight as it stands, it I don't think we have an exception for volunteers. How, how am I just misreading? Am I getting lost in the technicalities? We run the employer-employee relationship test. So there's um, six criteria to be met if the test um, shows that there's no employer-employee relationship, then wages wouldn't be owed. Okay, but then... So volunteers fall apart in place. Yeah. So volunteers aren't employees then and not subject to the wage and hour law. Okay, so th this this bill in conjunction with, with what already exists already carves out vo true volunteers. Correct. That's correct. Okay, so this this could stand as it is, and still you, people would still be able to to volu to volunteer to, to literally volunteer. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, okay, I think that's it for me. Members, any other questions on this one? Okay, thank you, uh, TLR staff, for being here. We appreciate it. Next up, we have SB 206. This prohibits discrimination, including in advertisements for available real property based on participation in the housing assistance program. Uh, first up on 206 is uh, Robin Wurzel for Shirley Ann Abusigawa for the Civil Rights Commission. Uh, yes. Good morning. Um Sorry, we stand, the HCRC, the Civil Rights Commission, stands in support um, and stand on our written testimony. If you have any questions, I'm available. Thank you. Next is Hakeem Wansafi, Executive Director for the Hawaii Public Housing Authority. Good morning, Chair, Vice Chair, yeah. members of the committee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify. We have submitted this testimony in support of this bill, and I'll stand on that testimony. I'm here for any questions that you may have. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, next is Scott Morishige for Governor's, I mean, Governor's Coordinator on Homelessness. Good morning, Chair Rhodes, morning. Uh, Vice Chair and members. I'm Scott Morishige, Governor's Coordinator on Homelessness. I stand on my written testimony and support. Thank you. Thank you. Next is uh, Michael Galoyu Jr. for the Stonewall Caucus of the Democratic Party of Hawaii. Hey, not present, Chair. Okay, he's in support. Uh, next is Rob Van Tassel, President and CEO of Catholic Charities of Hawaii. Uh, Betty Lou Larson. Oh. Okay, yep, yeah. sure, go ahead. Oh. Good morning, Chair and Vice Chair. I'm Betty Lou Larson representing Catholic Charities. And um, in order to save time, I'm also representing Partners of Care who also submitted written testimony. Both organizations strongly support this bill. We feel that this is really a critical step towards enab enabling our residents to utilize very valuable resources. And it's not only good for, of course, the people who get Section 8 or these vouchers, but it's good for landlords because tens of millions of dollars are coming into the state to assist landlords to be stable and have stable renters. Um, we help at Catholic Charities many struggling families and it's like winning the lottery and yet they can't use it. Many seniors have given up or others just can't find housing. So we strongly feel that all renters should have an equal chance, an equal playing field as far as looking at and applying for uh, available housing. Partners in Care also has housed almost 400 people under a Housing Now program. And the biggest problem they have is finding landlords. All the service providers report that. And our goal to, is to end homelessness. We can't end homelessness without resources for housing, to put people into housing and to keep them stable. That's what's so important about Section 8 and these housing vouchers is it not only places homeless families and individuals into housing, but it creates a stability that they now can move on with their lives and their children's lives. So we ask your strong support for this bill for rental housing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next we have uh, Kristen Alice for Hope Services Hawaii. 
Good morning. morning. Thank you for taking my testimony. My name is Kristen Ellis, and I'm representing Hope Services on the Big Island, also Community Alliance Partners, and I'm here in strong support of this measure. I'm not sure if you can hear the construction noise in the background, but that is at my apartment complex, Waikea Villas, where a real estate investor recently bought up the super majority of the units and has been systematically evicting my neighbors. Several of my neighbors received text messages telling them they'd be kicked out and that if they were on Section 8, they would not be welcome to reapply. This is just one example, one egregious example, but I think a representative example of what is happening all across the islands. You know, especially with the increase in out-of-state investors coming in over the last two years. We all know, we've all seen the property prices drastically increase. Um, but the problem is, is that we cannot get people, we cannot force people to accept or even give a chance to the people who are on vouchers. So I see this from the other side in my work um, with my colleagues who are housing locators and working to help people find housing. Um, instead of being able to take people on interviews and, you know, teach them any skills they might need to get housed, what they're doing is spending the days combing through advertisements, begging landlords, realtors, um, property managers to even just give an interview to our clients who are on Section 8. But because of this stereotype or misconception that people who receive vouchers are bad people or bad renters, they're not even being, they're not, they don't even have the door open to them. They're not even being allowed to apply. And that's just wrong. We got to do something about this. This is a cheap, easy, low hanging fruit way um, for us to start to level the playing field. And just to know we are working on the other half of it, which is communicating with landlords and folks who, you know, hold that power. Thank you very much. Please support this measure. Mahalo. Thank you. Next up is um, Matthew, and I'm sorry if I butchered your last name, Bua. Yes. Go ahead. Morning. Uh, good morning. Aloha and mahalo for allowing me to testify before you today. My name is Matthew Wu, and this will be my second year sharing my experiences with all of you. Not only am I a housing locator for Hope Services Hawaii, but I'm also a landlord with multiple homes here on Hawaii Island. My job is simple, find affordable housing for our clients and build strong professional relationships with our landlords. Last year, I shared with you that on the morning of testimony, I had found a total of 14 rental ads on Craigslist, Facebook, and Realtor's website stating no sex in Section 8 or third-party payments. I'm sad to say that this morning, I found a total of 18 ads on Craigslist and another 17 ads on Realtor's websites that again state no Section 8. That's a sad and frankly disturbing increase that all of us here today should be concerned with. While these ads are frustrating for me as a housing locator, again, I Again, I can only imagine how heartbreaking it is for a family who holds one of those housing vouchers. I communicate with these people on a regular um, basis, and when they first are awarded the voucher, they are elated and full of promise. Within a short amount of time, those positive expressions are turned into hopelessness, fear, desperation, and sometimes anger. When they find out, when they find out that they weren't given a chance to apply for a home, what did I do wrong? I'll take anything and who's letting this happen? And the worst question to which I have no answer, what will our local leaders do to change this? Let's not forget that these vouchers have a deadline. If a family doesn't find the home, yes, they can ask for an extension, but sooner or later, they will fail to, if they fail to find a home, the voucher is lost. I had a personal goal last year to house a specific family along with others whom I represent. This family is rather large, but within that family, I see future builders, leaders, and maybe a doctor or two. This family's housing navigator and I combed every website daily, and we were met with the same barriers as our clients. We moved on to the next. I, 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 I apologize, but I, I've been pretty consistent about enforcing the two-minute rule for a long time. Sure. So th thank you very much. I really appreciate your testimony. You. If you can hang around, people may have questions for you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, that's all for the Zoom testifiers. Next, we have Daintree Bartoldis, Executive Administrator for the State Council on Developmental Disabilities and Support, Radiant Cordero, Council Member from here on Oahu and Support, Trisha Kajimura, Deputy Director for Hawaii Health and Harm Reduction Center and Support, Nicole Wu for Hawaii Children's Action Network Speaks and Support, uh, Ken Haraki for Hawaii Association of Realtors and Opposition, 
and Alan Johnson for the Hawaii Substance Abuse Coalition also in support. That's all the testifiers we have on this measure on uh, members' questions. Senator Ocasio. I have a question for Matthew Law. Yes. Hi, thank you for uh, providing your, your personal um, experience as a housing locator. And I just actually think it's really important that you're um, able to express the rest of that story. Thank you. It's nice to see you again. Um, so I'll kind of leave, leave off. I had a, a personal goal last year of housing a specific family along with others whom I represent. This family is rather large, but within this family, I do see builders, leaders, maybe doctors or maybe a doctor or two. This family's housing a navigator and I combed every website daily and were met with the same barriers as our client. After three extensions, we were left defeated and in shock when we couldn't find a simple home for our client out of desperation. And as a landlord, I started looking for suitable investment properties where I could place this family. Two days later, I located a home that fit the requirements set for by county housing. I placed a cash offer into that home, was accepted, and that family's moving date is the 25th of February. Please do not take my sharing this story as a way of bringing notoriety to myself, but we must ask ourselves, what kind of place do we live in where a housing locator landlord who has no available units needed to purchase a home to make sure a family of eight would not be homeless. What we are asking for is simply quite um, simple and quite easy to accomplish. Stand with us and our most vulnerable in our community and approve SB 206 and bring an end to rental income discrimination to our landlords, property managers and realtors. I pleaded with you today to give our people the chance to speak and to apply for the homes you advertise, you will find grateful, eager, well-kept tenants who have rental stability in their hands, waiting for you to take advantage. Again, mahalo for allowing me this opportunity, and I genuinely hope I'm not here next year speaking on this topic. Mahalo. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Members, further questions? Uh, if not, I have a question for uh, Mr. Moore Shige, Governor's Office, the Coordinator for Homelessness. Uh, you put some statistics, I think, in your written testimony about um, the difficulty some people are having getting um, using vouchers. Can you just go over that a little more in, in a little more detail? Oh, thank you, Chair, for the question. Um, so right now in our community, we have a huge influx of um, federal resources through the emergency housing voucher program provided by HUD. And um, statewide, there's over um, 700 vouchers that have been added to our state's inventory. And these vouchers um, are public housing authorities, but HBJ and the four counties have started implementing um, these emergency housing vouchers starting from the fall. However, um, what we're hearing from the providers is, um, as Mr. Uo was saying, many of the people with these vouchers are experiencing real challenges in finding landlords um, that will accept them. So as a result, even though these vouchers have been um, potentially available since the fall, only um, 36 have been leased up to date statewide, at least according to um, the emergency housing voucher dashboard that's maintained by HUD. And we're hearing similar things with other um, voucher programs in the community, not just limited to Section 8, but also some of our um, state funded programs, such as permanent supportive housing, also known as Housing First, and similar programs administered by the counties. With the, uh, the emergency housing vouchers, you said 36 had found a place of how many were, were distributed or offered? Um, let me, let me um, pull up the dashboard and I can, uh, there's total statewide, um, I think over 700 have been awarded and um, the public housing authorities have started to roll these out. These are vouchers specifically targeted for people that are homeless or at risk of homelessness. Um, I think that there's challenges with the documentation for you know, for homeless individuals to kind of gather all the documents that are needed. But again, um, there's been a number of these vouchers in play and Okay. But pretty consistently, we're, we're hearing from the providers that they've just had these challenges finding um, people willing to accept them. Okay. And then particularly on Hawaii Island, you know, we had heard um, many stories similar to what Mr. Ua shared, that people were not able to um, 
utilize these. So I think total, um, there's maybe about 65 that have been issued. About half of that, 37, have been leased up to date out of a total of 708. Um, and I think that's just one program. So what I, what I want to emphasize is it's not limited just to those emergency housing vouchers, but I think in general, we have additional resources coming into the community. Um, in addition to that, there's the emergency rental assistance provided by the treasury to the counties. And um, in, with that um, particular resource, what we've started to encounter is individuals who are unsheltered that we're seeing, um, who are identified by our outreach providers who um, were approved for emergency rental assistance by the counties, but have were already evicted at the time that they were approved. So they're approved for rent moving forward, but again, they're facing similar challenges with okay. landlords who are unwilling to rent to people receiving government assistance. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's see, Mr. Owen Safi, are you still here? Yes, good morning. Good morning. Do you have any additional stats on you, you guys uh, administer some of the housing, some of the standard uh, Section 8 housing vouchers? Yes. Yeah, yes, we do. Uh, do you have any stats on the rejection rates there? Sure. But, uh, in addition to what Scott mentioned, uh, Scott only mentioned the ones that has to, that are currently homeless. We have others that are very poor, homeless that are in the search as of today. We have uh, 111 families currently looking for housing and they are unable to find it. Uh, the, 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 that already have a voucher. Yes, they already been processed. They have the voucher and they're hunting for, for housing. Okay, uh, all right. Uh, sorry, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, members, any additional questions? Okay, if not, that's the last bill on the agenda. Um, yeah, sorry, oh, Senator Favela, yeah, go ahead. Sir. I was uh, reading a text. I, I just got one question you know, on the vultures. Um, I, I see this bill and it, it's great. I mean, it's great to help our family on Section 8. But how are we going to enforce this, Chair? I just would want to know. So who can I ask this question online? I forget the person from, she's from, I guess, no, any of them. Anybody can answer that question? For me, Chair. Uh, well, it's, it, there's an enforcement mechanism in the bill. It's um, it's a it's a lawsuit. You'd have to you'd have to file for injunctive relief, and then you can be fined. Yeah, the know. only reason why I say that because we know and I have a lot of family and friends that you know is very blessed to have mm -hmm. Section Eight. So to use things like this, Chair. Oh, we're selling the place. Oh, my family coming back from the mainland. Uh, they need the opening. So. This is, like I said, it's a great bill. I just want to know how much, you know, we're going to have one, like one shock jaw bite, <laughs> or we're going to have one uh, small bite. I mean, you know, we're going to have this law that we're going to pass that is great. But if it's really not really helping the families that's being discriminated, as this time as we speak with these vouchers, um, how, how are we going to actually, I mean, you know, I mean, how are we going to go forward with this, Chair? It's, uh, it's like, it's like most laws; they're not self-enforcing. So I, you know, I, I think that the big game will just be that people, that landlords, the most of them will understand that they're not allowed to discriminate on that basis anymore, and then they yeah. won't. The hard cases will end up in court, like most hard cases do. So I, you know, there's no magic bullet, but I do think it's a, a useful, a useful bill. Yeah. Okay. I, I guess so. So any of them that is online, I guess, from the housing. Uh, of development or dis disabilities can reach to my office because I have two people in my community who have Section 8 vultures who's waiting for homes and right now is homeless uh, because, the, like I said, the people told them that their family is moving back and they had to get out at the ending of uh, December or the first of the January and the house is vacant, Chair. So that's the reason why I wanted to ask. I think this is a great thing. I just want to know how, as a community person like me, can help families like them from staying off the street because somebody had wasn't truthful on the fact that they was going to have somebody coming there and rented for more or whatever and discriminating against our Section 8 families. That's all. So, Thank you, Chair. So, 
So anyone who's on the Zoom call, if you could contact uh, Senator Favela's office, uh, that would be appreciated to, if, if there's something you can do to help there. Um, any other questions? I have a question. Yes, Senator Kim. So, um, and maybe clarifying, I, I have to apologize. I didn't read the bill as closely as possibly I should. But is it just in the advertising that they can't discriminate? Um, so if yeah. you don't advertise, you don't advertise, obviously people make excuses, right? I mean, they'll find all kinds of ways to avoid it, but. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, th I think probably the best way to look at it is it's, it's, uh, it's like a discrimination bill. So if you're, if you're rejected on the basis of race or gender or sexual orientation or any of those protected classes, um, that, that would be prohibited, but yes. So whether it's advertised or not. Um, right. You're, you're, you're not supposed to advertise it. You can't say no section. You wouldn't be able to say no section eight anymore. Right. But then you would still not be able to discriminate either. Okay, but you'd have to prove that you didn't. Yeah. Cause yeah. It was right. A, yeah, yeah, a yeah. Section eight. Yeah. I mean, exactly. Read it to, to somebody else or whatever. And okay, just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, members, any other questions? Okay, if not. Um, Members, do you, do you want to go to a breakout room to discuss any of these bills? Or if you, if you don't care, we'll just go ahead and go straight to decision making. Okay, I don't see any objections to going forward. So we'll go ahead and go straight to decision making. Uh, first up is SB 12, I mean 212. Uh, this is on, um, this increases the amount of fines that may be assessed against a non-candidate committee for violations of organizational reports and the amount of fines that may be assessed for violations of advertising disclaimer requirements. I would like to move this forward with the committee's indulgence. Um, I'll go ahead and put a bad defective date on, I mean a bad effect or a delayed effective date as it's technically called, uh, July 30, uh, 2050, July 30, 2050. And then I'd also like to amend it to apply the increased penalties for failure to put the paid for by disclaimer to non-candidate committees only. I'm, I'm worried about the big dollar uh, spenders. I'm not really so worried about somebody who forgot to put paid for by friends of Carl Rhodes on a t-shirt or something. And that would be it. That would be the, those would be the amendments. Any questions or concerns? If not, vice chair for voting, we do have, uh, I've already signed the voting sheets, so uh, you don't need to worry about that. Anyway, uh, Senator Kilkololi. Members voting on SB 212, the chair's recommendation is to pass this measure with amendments. Chair Rhodes? Aye. Vice Chair goes aye. Senator Ocasio? Aye. Senator Gabbard? Aye. Senator Lee? Senator Kim? Aye. Senator Favela? Aye. Uh, Senator Lee excused chair recommendation adopted. Right, thank you. Next is SB 665. This establishes that knowingly or intentionally providing false information concerning the name or address of a person paying for a campaign advertisement is a class C felony. Repeal certain exemptions from criminal prosecutions for campaign finance violations. Uh, this is another one that I would like to move on with the committee's indulgence. Um, as suggested by the AG, let's uh, replace provides prohibited information with contains false information about the time, place, or meaning of voting, or means of voting, sorry. And then we'll restore the men's, uh, the uh, state of mind requirement deleted in section three, so that the commission has to determine that, that, that um, it's not, it's kind of convoluted. So the, the commission would have to, campaign spending commission would have to say, they believe that the, a reckless state of mind, at least a reckless state of mind existed before they referred it to somebody else. I mean, re, I mean, referred it to prosecution. So they don't have to prove that it's a reckless state of mind, but they have to believe that it's a reckless state of mind at least before they move it on for prosecution. And let's see, I think that's it. Questions or concerns? If not, Vice Chair. Okay, members, uh, voting on SB 665, the chair's recommendation is to pass with amendments. Uh, of the members present, are there any reservations? Any opposition? Seeing none, all, all members present vote aye, Senator Lee excused. Chair recommendation adopted. 
Thank you. Next up is SB 741. This requires an elector to vote for the candidate whose name appears on the presidential general election ballot. Um, this is the faithless electors bill. A recommendation here is to pass with a couple of amendments. We're going to define mentally disabled, which is referred to in the statute uh, in the bill. And we'll also amend the bill to be sure that to, to be sure that it applies to an alternate elector as well. So if you replace somebody because they were being faithless and then the alternate was faithless, I just want to be sure that we can also remove them until we get somebody who's actually voting the way that they're supposed to vote. Questions or concerns? If not, Vice Chair. So that's with amendments, right? Yes. Members SB 741, passing with amendments of the members present, are there any no votes? Any reservations? Senator Lee is excused, Chair, recommendation adopted. All right, thank you. Uh, next up is SB 416. This clarifies applicable reimbursement to the state or defendant for expert witness fees. Uh, recommendation here is uh, there are uh, some SMA texts suggested, in, uh, so just technical amendments. Any questions? If not, Vice Chair. Uh, members voting on SB 416 passing with amendments. Um, are the members present? Any reservations? Any opposition? Uh, Senator Lee is excused. Recommendation adopted. All right, thank you very much. Next is SB 832. This expands the victim counselor privilege under uh, rules of evidence number 505.5 uh, to include confidential advocates employed by the University of Hawaii. Uh, recommendation is to pass with some amendments. Um, I'd like to add a severability clause and then we'll make some changes on the uh, making it clear that the privilege is not absolute, that it's only semi-absolute, which strikes me as a very oxymoronic word, but okay. And uh, there are some technical amendments as well. That's it. Questions or concerns? If not, Vice Chair. Members voting on SB 832 passing with amendments. Uh, are there any no's or reservations? Uh, Senator Lee is excused. Chair recommendation adopted. Thank you. Next up is SB 777. This establishes criminal statute for the, the destruction of a tree on state or county property punishable as a misdemeanor. A recommendation here is to go ahead and move it along, but I do have some, uh, some amendments, which let's see, this, this came through AEN first. Yeah, so Mike, if you uh, have any objections to any of this stuff, let's, we'll, we can talk about it, but I'd like to accept the AG's amendments apply, applying intentional or knowing state of mind to both parts of the offense and then um, provide for the possibility that an arborist doesn't have to be called if they can figure out the value of the tree uh, without calling one. But if they do call one, then we'd like to make it so that it's a certified arborist. So we're sure that we get uh, a, a good expert essentially is what it turns into. And we'd like to uh, integrate, my understanding is there's a, there are fines somewhere else in the HRS for destroying a tree. So if there are, we're gonna integrate those into this part of the statute so that the punishments are all in the same place. We haven't quite been able to determine that, but if, you know, so this is sort of a conditional amendment. And then we'll allow the judge to require the judge or the jury, I suppose, the, to require payment for the value of the tree or and or community service and or the cost to replace the tree and or the fines. So they'll have a, they won't have to do all of them, but they'll have a, the judge, the, the, uh, the judge or jury will have a opportunity to uh, bring down a punishment that's fitting for the, for the crime. And then per uh, uh, Ed Sniffen's testimony, uh, Deputy Director for the Department of Transportation will exclude government employees, federal, state, and county from the bill provided they're carrying out their job related duties. So there's no exception right now. And uh, so Senator Gabbard, I think the date is good right now. Do you, it's upon approval. Do you want me to leave it upon approval? You're the one who's gonna have to conference it. So if you want me to put a bad date on, we can do that. Yeah, why don't you go ahead, Carl, put a bad date on it. Okay, so July 30, 2050. That's good. Okay. 
And those are the proposed amendments. Uh, any questions or concerns? If not, Vice Chair. Members voting on SB 777 SD1, the Chair's recommendation is to pass with amendments. Uh, noting the excused absence of Senator Lee, uh, the members present, are there any reservations or no votes? Seeing none, Chair, recommendation adopted. Thank you very much, members. Next up is SB 573 relating to wildlife, requires all habitat conservation plans to include an agreement for plan participants to enter into and maintain an annual service contract with standby and response facility available to provide emergency medical and rehabilitation services to native wildlife. Um, so the bill, the only, the only suggestion, or again, I'll come back to Senator Gabbard coming out of uh, your committee as your, your lead anyway. Uh, it, it had an effective date of July 1, 2021, which needs to be changed. Um, but do you want to go for July 1, 2022, or do you want to put a bad date for conference purposes? Uh, bad days. Okay. Thank you. So we'll, the only amendment will be July 30, 2050 as, a, as, a, as the effective date. Questions or concerns? If not, Senator Kiel Kaloli. Members, SB 573 passing with amendments. Are there any no's or reservations? Senator Lee's excused. Chair recommendation adopted. Thank you very much. Next up is SB 988. This establishes guidelines for unpaid internships under the state wage and hour law. Uh, recommendation here is to, um, well, there's a technical amendment having to do with the preamble, um, had the wrong act referenced there. Um, I think also in the committee report, I would like to um, put in language reflecting what the Department of Labor and Industrial Relations commented about for the volunteer aspect of it, just to be clear that this does not prohibit volunteers uh, when, when, they're, when they're really volunteers and not actual employees. So I'd like to put that in the committee report. Uh, other than that, uh, that would be it. Any questions or concerns? Okay, if not, Vice Chair. So that's with amendments? Yes. Okay, members, SB 988 passing with amendments. Are there any no's or reservations? Senator Lee is excused, recommendation adopted. All right, thank you, members. To the last bill, which is SB 206, this prohibits discrimination, including in, in advertisements for, real, real, for available real property based on participation in housing assistance programs um, or source of income. Our recommendation here is to go ahead and pass it with an amendment to include uh, in the preamble some of the number, um, the statistics that Mr. Moore Shige had in his testimony, um, which were for the emergency housing vouchers, only 36 of 708 distributed or awarded were able to find housing. So we'll just put that in the preamble. Uh, other than that, I think that's it. Any, uh, any other questions or concerns? Okay, seeing none, Vice Chair. Members, SB 206, SD1 passing with amendments. Are there any reservations or opposition? Seeing none, Senator Lee's excused, recommendation adopted. All right, thank you, members. And so we, that's our first uh, hearing for the year and we'll have another one on Thursday. Thanks so much for being here. We're adjourned. <laughs>